Thank you. Uh, I'm very uh, grateful for the introduction because it goes to uh, evidence one of the points I'm going to be making today in the lecture that you can't believe everything you read in the press. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that I'll allow plenty of time for discussion. Um, if, if I feel, I mean, if you feel, if you get, if you feel I'm going on too much, just the exit is over there. Uh, if I feel I'm going on too much, um, I'll try to, to skip, but stay in touch with my uh, uh, technology, the, the, um, the visuals. So, about 150 years after it was established, Speaker's Corner remains a powerful inspiration to millions all over the world who are still struggling for rights to free expression and public assembly, which we in this country have enjoyed for generations. And how rare and precious are those freedoms? Consider in just how many countries it would be impossible or perhaps inadvisable for citizens to gather together as we have today. Amnesty International's latest report uh, identifies no fewer than 91 countries, lamentably including countries in the European Union and the British Commonwealth, in which freedom of expression is somehow restricted or altogether suppressed. Uh, or just uh, imagine that the person sitting next to you who you don't know, uh, or perhaps you think you do, <laughs> may be there expressly to report to some higher authority on what was said and who heard it. As uh, uh, Edward Snowden has recently reminded us, state surveillance did not go out of fashion with the Stasi. And you'll note that I'm wearing two microphones, one, the purpose of one of which I understand, the other one is not entirely clear to me. <laughs> um, my argument, which is based on 20 years in frontline politics and the last uh, uh, seven as the director of Speaker's Corner Trust uh, is that association between citizens and the free face-to-face -face exchange of ideas, information and opinions uh, with each other as well as decision takers uh, among them is a key not just to rebuilding trust and participation in our democracy but also to creating a stronger and indeed a happier society. First, uh, I believe, we must recover our understanding of and respect for our freedoms and for the world of ideas which has shaped and continues to shape them. But we need to go further. Rights must not just be learned and appreciated, uh, in my view. They must be expressed. Uh, a true state of democracy does not exist simply because the rights of the citizen are guaranteed by a constitution or protected uh, by law. Rights are like muscles. If they're not exercised, they become weak and ineffectual. And just as the body grows strong and healthy through the regular exercise of its muscles, so, I contest, the democratic society is strengthened and renewed through the constant and vigorous exercise of its freedoms. So in this lecture, I want to argue that if we are to revive our flagging democracy, we have to reactivate our sense of citizenship and first of all, reinvigorate our right to free expression. Isaiah Berlin, in his lecture and essay, uh, 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 on uh, his essay Liberty, made an important distinction between what he defined as positive and negative uh, liberty. He characterized positive liberty as the individual's freedom to pursue rights and entitlements. Negative liberty he regarded as an absence of oppressive authority. Interestingly, uh, he believed that negative liberty was the more important because it created the space in which individuals can act without the interference of others. Indeed, he was wary of attempts by the state to shape the choices which citizens might make, even in a benign cause, such as uh, the interests of public safety or public health, because those motives were so open to abuse. And ultimately, he wrote, to coerce a man is to deprive him of freedom. And this, of course, was the principle which John Stuart Mill had advanced almost exactly a century earlier in his great essay uh, on liberty, in which uh, he wrote, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to present, uh, prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant over himself, over his body and mind. The individual is sovereign. So both he and Berlin saw in positive liberty the seeds of authoritarianism. 
when Berlin delivered his lecture in 1958, he would have been keenly aware of the repressive control, which is central to the totalitarian concept of freedom, which lay at the extreme end of the spectrum of positive liberty. He went further, or Mill went further. For him, democracy itself posed a threat uh, to liberty, for it represented, in his words, the tyranny of the majority over the individual. So uh, I acknowledge that I, I've considerably simplified uh, Isaiah Berlin's complex argument. He did, after all, recognize that both concepts of liberty lived and often contested together, and that both are necessary elements of a free society. But I do want to emphasize uh, the point I've already made, that negative, or what I would prefer to call passive liberties, alone cannot underpin the free society. Uh, for democracy to function and flourish, citizens, both individually and collectively, must be active in exercising their rights, whether or not that is their natural inclination, and should do so for a general as well as a personal good. In other words, as Isaiah Berlin recognized, the elusive goal of reconciling through deliberation and debate the conflict of these two apparently incompatible yet inseparable concepts of liberty is a proper preoccupation for those who care about democracy. So how, how should we set about that quest and how also do we seek to resolve the competition between our own rights and those, those of others? Uh, I've chosen these words uh, carefully. I, I want to emphasize that um, the importance and virtue of the process is not diminished by our failure to achieve a satisfactory outcome. So I would like to uh, advance three propositions. First, that democracy is a living and evolving organism, which if not constantly renewed, decays. That, that is literally becomes decadent. And second, that a key means of democratic renewal is active participative citizenship. The third, to which I'll return uh, shortly, is that the free flow of ideas and opinions is essential to that citizenship. Uh, I'd like to add uh, two observations to those three uh, propositions, one about ideas and the other about social organization. First, though I cannot speak for the rest of the animal kingdom, uh, the capacity for ideas is fundamental to the human condition. As Aristotle observed, man is the rational animal. But further, having had an idea, for most of us, much of the time, the instinct is to communicate it. Uh, indeed, it can be said that ideas and the impulse to share them preceded and indeed necessitated our facility of ordered speech. As Aristotle also taught, man is by nature a political animal, by which he meant that we are intuitively social. It's because of our innate need to communicate what we think that we regard people who lack the confidence or the skill or the opportunity to express ideas as often frustrated and unhappy and sometimes damaged individuals. It's also why we regard societies which do not enjoy the right to free expression and association as repressive, unhappy, and often failed and dangerous states. So returning to the contest between uh, concepts of liberty, my second observation is that as social animals we are bad enough to need laws which regulate our behavior, but good enough to frame and for the most part abide by them. We know that left to our own devices, the fittest prosper at the expense of the weak, and that in unequal societies, the powerful exploit their access to knowledge and information, not just to preserve their privileges, but also to frame ideologies which justify them. So democracy, literally the rule of the people, while no guarantor of equity is nevertheless our best attempt to reconcile the best and worst of human instincts and to guarantee the greatest individual liberty commensurate with a collective good. As Aristotle taught, the aim of politics is the good society. And as I suggested in my first proposition, democracy can be seen as an endless process of debating and redefining what that good is. Indeed, from the very beginning, uh, democracy, in contrast, uh, for example, to tyranny, has been associated with the exercise of reason and the practice of debate. Uh, Plato taught that justice and virtue can only be achieved when reason prevails 
over the irrational impulses of spirit and desire. Uh, in ancient Athens, it was not just the philosophers, but also the statesmen who believed in the primacy of reason and the exposition of ideas and opinions which were required to acquire and express it. Pericles, in his great funeral oration for the dead of the Peloponnesian <coughs> War of 430 BC, arguably uh, a ruinous uh, uh, war that uh, um, took place uh, despite uh, rather than because of democracy, uh, in his oration, he spoke not just about power and public good, but also about the contribution of reason and debate to both. He said, uh, we reach decisions on public policy only after full discussion, believing that sound judgment, far from being impeded by debate, is arrived at only when full information is considered before a decision is made. He was also very clear about the role of participative citizenship in good government. Our government is called a democracy because power resides uh, not in a few people, but in the majority of our citizens. But every person has equal rights before the law. Prestige and respect are paid those who win them by their merits, regardless of their political, economic, or social status. And no one is deprived of making his contribution to the city's welfare. Uh, but crucially, he went much further in asserting that those who did not fulfill their obligations as citizens by immersing themselves in political life are socially useless. Indeed, our word idiot is derived from the Greek for someone who puts his self-interest before public service. For Pericles, idiotes is both a selfish and an ignorant person. Now you know, you understand why <laughs> idiocy is in the title. Oh, well, actually, that's one reason why idiocy might be in the title of uh, my lecture. He said, our private citizens, though occupied with their personal business, are still fair judges of public manners. Unlike people of other nations, Athenians regard those who take no part in civic duties, not as unambitious, but as useless. Crucially, the Athenians also believed that the right to free speech implicitly conferred, conferred a duty to the truth. They even had a word uh, for this obligation, pahesia, as the French theorist, uh, theorist Michel Foucault described it in his, lecture on, his lectures on fearless speech, parhesia is a verbal activity in which a speaker recognizes truth-telling as a duty to improve or help other people as well as himself. In parhesia, the speaker uses his freedom and chooses frankness instead of persuasion, truth instead of falsehood or silence, the risk of death instead of life and security criticism instead of flattery, and moral duty instead of self-interest and moral apathy. And he looks quite pleased with himself. <laughs> but returning to Pericles, uh, the glorious Athenian citizenship of which he spoke, of course, excluded the majority of the population, made up by women, slaves, and a very wide definition of foreigners. And we also recall that Socrates paid for his paesia with his life. But as I've argued, democracy is not so much an end as an endless means, and it is through the competition of ideas that we constantly redefine its principles and extend its boundaries. Uh, that process, it has to be said, can take us further from as well as closer to enlightenment. Some 350 years after Pericles, Cicero believed that politics was not so much about personal virtue as the protection of property. Uh, and his Roman values are perhaps more closely aligned to our societies than those of ancient Athens. So, if Pericles walked among us today, would he consider us citizens or idiots? I want to turn to uh, the state of our own democracy and what we need to do to stimulate and sustain it. You'll see that I am both pessimistic about where we are and optimistic about where we can be. It, it's certainly the case that a democracy cannot exist without the guarantee of free expression. But free speech can also be a feature of non-democratic systems. A benevolent dictatorship, for example, may allow its citizens to think and even speak as they wish, so long as those with real power 
are left to make the decisions. These are functionless and therefore rather hollow freedoms. But some may think uh, that I've just described the way we live here and now in the UK. And many of them will want to blame a political elite for degrading our democracy by taking powers to themselves, which should rightfully be ours. Even if there is at least some truth in this, I want to argue that the fault lies as much and probably more with citizens than it does with politicians. While politicians have often been prepared to abridge or appropriate particular rights in the name of some more pressing, if arguable, uh, public good, for example, protection from terrorism, I believe that citizens have ceded more general rights simply by failing to exercise them. There is now a very considerable and growing literature which plots the atomization of social and political life and its consequences for developed democracies. Uh, Robert Putnam's account of the post-war decline of social capital in the United States, bowling alone, is perhaps the best known analysis, but that trend has been mirrored uh, here too in the UK. Uh, a poll for the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts, in 2007, found that 70% of those questioned had no ties with any local community group, rising to 80% among 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, in 2010, the government's final citizenship survey before it uh, abandoned the series found that only 33% had engaged in civic participation at least once in the previous year, the lowest it had ever recorded. Now, as the world around us changes, as our means of interaction multiply and demands for our, in, uh, our attention intensify, it's perhaps inevitable that our preoccupations and our habits will adapt to that new and complex set of circumstances and indeed opportunities. Some will argue that increased disposable income and time and a greater range of consumer choice have actually made us freer than ever before, freer both from poverty and ill health and to make our own decisions about the way we live our lives. But how does this new freedom manifest itself? In the context of this discussion, perhaps more worrying than the diminishing commitment to community life is the decline in confidence, interest, and above all, participation in our political processes. The data shows that a smaller proportion of the electorate has voted in the last three than in any of the preceding 22 general elections since 1918. Before 2001, when the turnout, turnout hit 59%, it had never fallen be below 70%, and in 1950, it peaked at almost 84%. Uh, that trend, sadly, shows little sign of abating. The Hansard Society's 10th Annual Audit of Political Engagement, published just last month, found that only 41% would be certain to vote in an imminent general election, down by a very significant 17% in just two years. In the 18 to 24 uh, age range, the figure is as terrifyingly low as 12%. Uh, this decline in voter turnout is reflected in the near collapse of political activism. The combined membership of Britain's main parties has fallen from over 3 million in the 1960s to around 400,000 today. That's about 1% of the electorate, uh, with trade union membership almost halved in a gen generation down from about 13 million to about six and a half in 2011. And now all three major parties are even struggling to field local election candidates. Of course, exercising one's vote or being politically active are not the only, perhaps not even the best ways of making a difference in one's community. Yet the Hansard Society found that those 60% agree that if democracy is to work properly, every citizen should be involved in politics, 54% said that they don't have enough time. So how has our democracy become so optional and at the same time so dysfunctional? Let me return to the question about the balance between self-interest and public service. In, in my view, the unintended consequences of two factors above all have contributed to our problems. First, 
the relative affluence of the post-war years has perhaps inevitably eroded the sense of common cause which people in need of decent housing, education, healthcare, work and wages felt. I believe that we have not yet found alternative bases for community. So no, now we are constantly and are constantly encouraged by admin and politicians alike to be aspirational for what we, for what we don't have but sel seldom content with what we do. So now many of us are jealous of our property and fearful for our safety, suspicious that our neighbours might be enjoying better rights than ourselves but don't deserve them. We are resentful of politicians whom we believe are actually just like us, self-interested. And this is a big problem because, in, in my view, if it's an article of faith that our economy and with it our wealth must grow each year in perpetuity, we are bound to be disappointed. Though we struggle to deny it, there is, of course, an end to ever-increasing affluence. If nothing else, the, the, the sorry state of Western finances and how they were brought low by greed, perhaps a, an unfettered extension of aspiration, should have taught us that we can't all keep getting richer all the time. We should have learned that increasing one's standard of living is not synonymous with improving one's quality of life, and often quite the opposite if it makes people, as I've suggested, suspicious, resentful, uncooperative, and ultimately unhappy. Uh, tellingly, uh, according to a poll carried out for the BBC, while Britain was by 2006 three times richer than it was 50 years earlier, the proportion of those describing themselves as really happy had declined from 52% to 36%. Indeed, the economic historian Avner Offer has made the case that the single-minded pursuit of affluence and more recently choice has undermined rather than underpinned the quality of life we seek. He uh, implies that although wealth can contribute to welfare, uh, an obsessive consumption keeps us from what will really make us happy, namely relationships with family, friends, and neighbors. Of course, there is now a growing interest in the economics of happiness and well-being, and one of its leading proponents, the LSE's Professor Richard Layard, has noted the correlation between the capacities for happiness and trust, and cited evidence that those who believe that most people in Britain can be trusted has declined from 56% in 1959 to 31% in 1995. So this unhappiness and distrust extends beyond our attitudes to each other, uh, to our institutions. In 2004, Cambridge University's Faculty of Economics ranked the UK ninth happiness and 10th in terms of life satisfaction of the 15 European Union countries it surveyed. Uh, in an interview, the project's leader Dr. Luisa Carrada suggested that uh, the countries uh, that scored highest for happiness also reported the highest levels of trust in their governments, laws, and each other. The UK shows lower trust in government, the police, and other institutions, and higher social distrust, which might explain why the level of happiness amongst British people is also lower compared with other countries. As these findings uh, illustrate, the interplay between personalized aspiration and the loss of trust in relationships clearly has implica uh, implications for our commitment to community and our faith in institutions. But while it might be anticipated that in a free society, a loss of trust in the political process would lead to uh, reassertion of citizens' rights, based on the dramatically decreasing levels of voter turnout and political activity, the opposite has been the case. Large numbers of us do not believe, but nevertheless behave as if we have achieved so perfect a state of democracy that we can afford to delegate our obligations to a small group of guardians in whom when asked we say we do not trust so that we may enjoy other more important freedoms to acquire more, consume more, aspire still further. The second factor, uh, in my view, in our cultural dislocation is the information revolution. We now have access to far more information and a far wider variety of sources than our parents enjoyed. We can communicate with people on the other side of the world about any subject at any time. We can use the internet 
to campaign, to argue and debate, and for many oppressed people, it is their only means of free expression. But for increasing numbers, the internet has introduced a virtual reality which demands so much less of us than the real world. Increasingly, increasingly our children brought up with laptops, mobile phones, computer games, and multi-channel 24-hour a day TV have come to view and often to negotiate life and relationships through a screen. Well, it's argued uh, that democracy is well served by uh, the opportunities the internet affords for engagement. The anonymity, anonymity of online identity means that people can contribute to blogs and forums without ever justifying their opinions to themselves, much less to others which is why so much online debate is so negative, abusive, and destructive. This is not so much engagement as a substitute for it. Moreover, as the time we devote to our devices continues to increase, so the scope for other forms of activity inevitably diminishes. Every minute we spend in front of a screen is a minute we're not forming or enjoying relationships with our own families, friends, colleagues, or neighbors. The internet has undoubtedly opened a window on the world, but there is a risk that in doing so, it has also slammed the door on our neighbors. As J.B. Priestley presciently observed decades before the digital age, the more we elaborate the means of our communication, the less we communicate. I, I accept that the internet has created the basis for a new kind of, of global citizenship. And if that increases our knowledge of and our respect for other people and other cultures, it's of course very welcome. But a world citizenship which somehow bypasses local relationships and can be turned off and on by the click of a mouse could ultimately be doing more harm than good to the concept of community. I believe that, that many of us understand this dilemma, if only at an intuitive level. While a wide range of, of web-based social networking tools helped to coordinate the popular uprisings which became known as the Arab Spring uh, and that we're seeing now on the streets of Brazil and Turkey. One of their principal uses was the organization of the mass demonstrations of real people in real public spaces uh, which actually brought about the changes we've seen in Tunisia and in Egypt. At critical moments, people feel an irresistible urge actually to come together. But though this is significant, uh, on its own, in my view, it's not enough. We have seen in those countries, and particularly in Libya and Syria, that while the uprisings may have succeeded in mobilizing opposition to repressive regimes, they've struggled to deliver their initial promise because they have failed through deliberation and debate to secure consensus about the change they seek. They have been rebellions but are not yet revolutions. There may have been common purpose in challenging the status quo, but common cause in building the future has been harder to achieve. And that is the issue on which I would like to focus as I draw towards a conclusion. The fact that we have not so far managed to master either our new affluence uh, or our new technologies does not make the task of rediscovering and revitalizing participative uh, citizenship impossible, it, but it does make it more urgent. Uh, I mentioned that the capacity to have and the instinct to communicate ideas are defining features of our humanity. Ind indeed, that word uh, communicate shares the same Latin root with so many other words about joint endeavor, many with positive values such as combine, common, compromise, consensus, cooperate, community, and of course, uh, some less so, such as combat, compete and conflict. However, uh, it's my contention that when we're not communicating, we're unlikely to be developing common cause or for that matter, cooperating. And if we're not doing these things, what is the basis for community and ultimately for a democracy that is founded on our capacity and our willingness to build consensus? It's an important part of a speaker, uh, Speaker's Corner, uh, Corner Trust's mission to encourage people to reevaluate and rehabilitate the hard-won rights we now neglect, unaware perhaps of the role they've played not just in shaping the society in which we live, but also in shaping its future. 
among the most important is our right to free thought and speech. Indeed, since the signing of Magna Carta, um, the 800th anniversary of which we celebrate in two years' time, when the contest for power, or at least a share uh, of that power, between elites and commoners began in earnest in this country, free speech has been a key instrument as well as an object in the struggle for rights. Uh, securing our rights to free thought, belief, expression, uh, association, and assembly has taken many centuries, not least because those in both spiritual and temporal power well understood the need to suppress arguments before they became movements for reform. Only in 1689 uh, did the Bill of Rights give MPs the right to free speech, and then only in Parliament, and no one else enjoyed such privileges, certainly not the advocates of reform. While a century later, in 1791, Tom Paine's The Rights of Man was a bestseller, he was forced to flee abroad and was convicted in his absence of seditious libel. In August 1819, magistrates in Manchester ordered the cavalry, sabres drawn, to charge a crowd which had gathered to listen to the radical orator Henry Hunt. Twelve people were killed, according to some estimates, 600 injured, and Hunt spent two years in prison. But sadly, though, when I spoke to a gathering of secondary school students in Trafford uh, a couple of years ago, uh, none of them was aware that the Peterloo massacre had taken place just a short distance from where we were meeting. Just a few months after Peterloo, the six acts reinforced legislation of just 20 years earlier, further curtailing rights to free speech and assembly and imposing a stamp duty on newspapers, which put them beyond the reach of working people. Later in the 19th century, those who gathered in Hyde Park, I expect you were wondering when I was get, going to get round to, <laughs> to Hyde Park and Speaker's Corner, uh, to protest against the injustices of everyday life in industrial Britain and to campaign for their rights were met by huge shows of force by, by the police. Indeed, it was only in 1872 that the Parks Regulation Act established a legal right to gather at what became Speaker's Corner. But when almost 40 years later, the socialist Herbert Blythe took to his soapbox to protest against the imprisonment of Oscar Wilde, uh, he was arrested for outraging public decency. Uh, another 20 years on and well into the 20th century, Guy Aldred, an anarchist, was arrested there for using insulting words about the Union Jack. So it was as recently as 1998 that Parliament enshrined in law our right to free expression when the Human Rights Act, which some quite serious politicians would now like to repeal, codified provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. So I, I've made this brief uh, uh, excursion through the evolution of free speech in this country, guided by uh, John Roberts' essay on the development of free speech in modern Britain, uh, which can be found on our website, uh, in an attempt to dispel the twin popular delusions. First, that this has always been a land of freedom, uh, and second, that we have outlived its golden age. As history shows, our rights and our democracy have developed through the constant challenge of the status quo. But just as they have been won, our liberties can be lost again. Though we have not yet celebrated the centenary of universal suffrage, as we have seen, fewer and fewer of us now value or exercise that most fundamental of democratic rights to choose our own government. So I'm with uh, John Roberts when he concludes his essay with these words. Free speech, then, is not merely a gift bestowed on us by judges and government ministers. Free speech and what it means and entails depends on people coming together in order to test its limits. A healthy democracy demands this. So the democratic uh, evangelist's task, in my view, is to mine beneath the self-interest and the cynicism of modern life into the rich vein of goodwill and energy present in every community and to make a convincing case that we cannot enjoy our entitlements as citizens unless others have the same rights and that none of us can properly experience our freedoms without fulfilling our responsibilities to others. That's what Speaker's Corner Trust seeks to do in creating 
new opportunities for people to come together to discuss their interests and priorities, and by providing new platforms for unmediated expression, exchange, and engagement, we are tapping in to that reservoir of ideas, intelligence, and community spirit, which make neighborhoods, cities, societies viable. The process starts with a much wider public debate about the things that matter to us than we're currently having. So the first step in reactivating citizenship and reinvigorating democracy, in my view, is to get people to start communicating with each other again, engaging in the world of ideas, literally coming back down the garden path to talk to each other. Uh, that may sound nostalgic and sentimental and in the digital age outmoded, but if neighbors aren't talking to neighbors, they're hardly likely to be talking to, much less influencing politicians. And if people aren't talking to each other, as I suggested earlier, there is little basis for community. But if we wait for politicians to deliver all our aspirations, we will inevitably remain disappointed. I believe in both politics as a process and in politicians as people who are for the most part committed to a public good. But perhaps now more than at any other time, they find themselves unable to show leadership in the public debates we should be having. Today, it's almost impossible for a politician to express an original thought which does not resonate with a popular orthodoxy uh, or reflect the prejudice of a powerful vested interest without making himself or herself the target for vilification and ultimately electoral fa failure. Politicians themselves are partly to blame. They have made a big mistake, in my view, in encouraging people to believe that they can and will deliver everything that's asked of them, even though they know that it's impossible, even if it were desirable or reasonable. They should be much more honest and courageous about the need to draw the line at, at which their limited powers end and the responsibility and power of citizenship begins. They need, too, to be much more open to the truth that ideas, insights, and intelligence of citizens can contribute to framing rather than simply validating policy. For our part, we as citizens should recall Pericles' description of a truly participative democracy as it echoes across two and a half millennia. We and politicians need to acknowledge that in sending our representatives to parliament, we do not dispense with our obligations either to ourselves or to each other, and that in criticizing the shortcomings of our leaders, we are also implicitly condemning our own failures. That is why I say that citizenship is not just an entitlement, but a challenge. Democracies are only as good as we collectively make them. Or put another way, democracy cannot flourish without active participative citizenship. We have a huge opportunity to unlock the abundant talent there is in every neighborhood in ways which enrich individuals and revitalize communities. We just need to create opportunities and encouragement for the experience we have with the Speaker's Corner Project shows clearly that there is a huge unfulfilled appetite for citizenship. So would it not be wonderful if every town and city had a Speaker's Corner as a symbol of our rights as citizens as well as a platform for expression and exchange, as indeed many did before mass communications and in particular the TV swept them away? Would it not be exhilarating to see once again with heads brimming with ideas and portmanteau full of pamphlets, the great thinkers and speakers of the day traveling from town to town to engage their fellow citizens in dispute and debate? Uh, would it not be inspirational if we could transform Parliament Square as uh, Speaker's Corner Trust uh, and the Hansard Society and a range of partners are proposing as a means of celebrating the Magna Carta anniversary. Transform it from a hostile, unlovely roundabout into something like the Athenian Agora, a genuine space for citizenship uh, and the proper focus for the institutions of state which surround it. In our different ways, I suspect that all of us here today are in some way striving to create or recreate a culture 
in which ideas and opinions matter and form the basis for richer lives and stronger communities. The expression, exchange and celebration of ideas in genuinely open and inclusive public debate is in my view the key to restoring not just faith in our democracy, but also the strength and cohesion of our communities and the essential confidence in our own capacity to improve our lives and those of our neighbours. Let us choose the path of reason, cooperation and citizenship. The other way lies idiocy. <laughs>